So indeed, uh, now it's time for the uh, next contributed talk uh, of the conference, which uh, is by Yinkai Uyang. Um, and he is going to be uh, telling us uh, about compilation by stochastic Hamiltonian sparsification uh, from space. It is. So um, Yinkai, whenever you're ready, please just um, take it away and we'll get going. Well, thanks actually for the introduction and thank you everyone for logging in to see this talk. And this talk is about, um, it's a joint work with David White and Earl Campbell. And this problem really is, uh, is a problem about quantum simulation. So suppose that we are interested in simulating a very simple molecule um, and we can describe it with a Hamiltonian perhaps on a several number of qubits. The problem is that this Hamiltonian even for a very simple molecule, say ethane or propane, can have a huge number of terms because the number of terms in this Hamiltonian decomposition, where each of these P's typically is a multi-qubit Pauli matrix, the number of these terms can be as large as 100,000. So this would be a great number of terms to worry about. And the problem that we are interested in is quantum simulation, which precisely is simulating the unitary matrix E to the minus I H T. And what we are given are elementary gates, E to the I theta P J, where each P J is, for example, a multi-qubit Pauli operator. And because we are approximating this um, ideal unitary matrix with these elementary gates, there will be a simulation error, which we would like to minimize and obtain an upper bound on and also we would have to use as few gates as possible as few of these elementary gates as possible so this is one approach to quantum simulation that i would like to focus on and the idea of this work is to hybridize two previous approaches to trotterization so that we can inherit the goodness of both schemes and to see if we can outperform the previous schemes. So the two schemes that I'm comparing with are basically given by the orange line and the green line. The orange line is a previous uh, trotterization approach by Charles Ostrander and Sue, and the green line is by Earl Campbell. So the question is, can we get a better upper bound on the simulation error than these two lines over here? So first of all, we'll start with the problem of uh, simulating this e to the i minus ht. The trotterization approach is very well known. Basically, in order to do this, we, instead of doing the h and one shot, we can do these elementary gates. We have a product of unitaries over here. But the problem is in the simulation error of this trotterization approach, it scales as order s squared, where s is the time over here. So if we are interested to do a simulation of time t, where t is very large, when t is large in this formula, you can see that this error term blows up. But one simple approach to this is then instead of doing this entire simulation time in one go, to break it into many different time steps, baby time steps s. And for each of these baby time steps, the trotterization error will be small and the overall simulation error would just go as r times o s square and can hence be suppressed as long as we pick s to be sufficiently small. Now, um, I would use this um, notation to represent unitary operators called the semi-group picture but really it's a way to compress notation for the purposes of this talk because if we are simulating doing a quantum simulation on a unitary on a density matrix row, what you have to do is you have to multiply the left side with a unitary and the right side with a unitary. This notation is quite cumbersome and we use this exponential of this Louvi operator to represent it. And similarly, for the ideal quantum channel that we want to implement, instead of writing uh, this e to the minus i h s row e to the i h s over here, we use the left hand side, which is just the exponent of S mathcal L, which is simpler notation. So using this semi-group uh, notation for our, for our um, quantum simulation, 
we can introduce what other areas um, that we are going to visit are going to look like. So vanilla trotter is something that I'm sure that most of you are very familiar with. So in vanilla trotter, you basically do these uh, in order to simulate a Hamiltonian with a large number of terms, you just simulate it term by term. So you can simulate it in any order you please. Perhaps you would like to simulate it forwards in a forwards direction or in a backward directions from the elf term to the first term in descending order. But what's important is that for any order that you attempt to do this trotterization, the error would scale as order of S squared. It was recognized recently by Charles Ostrander and Sue that if one could do something slightly better, if one introduces a stochastic uh, map instead of, uh, of a perfect, um, instead of a non-stochastic map. So instead of doing forwards or backwards alone, one can do this trotterization forwards and backwards, each with probability half. And the advantage of doing this is that these simulation error can be very much improved. It can be brought down from order S squared to order S cubed, which is a huge improvement when S is small. And this translates to a simulation error that scales as order L squared, where L is the number of terms. Previously also, um, a different approach to trotterization has been studied. And, we, and in this talk, I'll call this the sparsification approach. Recall that the Hamiltonian can have a great many number of terms, for example, like 100,000. And the question is, can we have the simulation error that does not scale as L squared, but as something else? And in this Q-drift algorithm introduced previously, um, one, instead of doing the full trotterization in each baby time step S, one picks only one of the terms to simulate with a certain probability, especially chosen probability. And in this approach, the simulation error would scale, it not in terms of capital L square explicitly, but in terms of lambda square, where lambda can potentially be smaller than the number of terms capital L, if the Hamiltonian coefficients are sufficiently small, which is typically the case in many quantum chemistry problems. So now we are faced with two different trotterization algorithms. One of them is a stochastic map where you do um, the forwards trotterization with some probability and the backwards with some probability. And the other is a sparsification approach where one tries to greatly reduce the number of terms that is used in each trotter step. And the idea in this paper is to, is to hybridize these two approaches and we call this algorithm sparse because sparse is sparse from sparsification and sto is from stochastic. So what is this algorithm? First of all, let me um, explain more what Hamiltonian sparsification is in a picture. So imagine that each of these boxes represents attempting to simulate a single Hamiltonian term. We can have a great many number of these terms, but instead of simulating all of them in a trotterization, we would pick each term with a certain preset probability, pi, p1, p2, and so on. And provided these probabilities are small, one can imagine that the expected number of terms that we pick in each baby totalization step would be much smaller than perhaps 100,000, maybe it can be much less. And this is how we would attempt to sparsify the Hamiltonian. Of course, we want to hybridize it with the stochastic approach, which means that we want to do a forwards and a backward directions um, too. So what we do is that we specify the forwards direction by introducing these probabilities of picking the trotterization terms, and similarly for the backward trotterization direction, and we get an effective quantum channel that is uh, that is uh, equal. Uh, that, is, uh, that picks the forward direction and the backward directions with equal probability. But this time, the forward and backward directions, they are, they are, um, they are quantum channels and not, and not unitary maps because of the randomness involved. And the goal that we want to do is to have an upper bound on the simulation error, which we quantify using the diamond norm. And the main result is an upper bound on the diamond norm. And it is expressed in terms of these quantities, the Hamiltonian coefficients. 
recall that these Hamiltonian coefficients appear in this Hamiltonian decomposition. And in general, these pJs are just um, operators of single va singular value set to one. And each hj pj is selected with probability pj. And this probability is something that is preset. And because we have these probabilities, we would know that the expected number of terms per trotter step, per baby trotter step, would be just the sum of these probabilities, which we can uh, set to be mu. Then the simulation error we have is an upper bound given by this. This looks quite complicated, but the important fact is that the, um, the first term scales as one over G, the second term as one over G square, and the third as one over G cube. And for the parameter regime we're interested in, G is the number of gates and it's very large, like 10 to the 15 perhaps. And so um, the last term can be ignored and it's probably dominated by the first term or the second term, but then there are constants inside that we need to worry about as well. So the fact is that when we set the probabilities to all approach one, which means that we are not uh, doing any specification at all, our our simulation bound over here approaches that of the previous result of Charles Ostrander and Sue, where we um, probabilistically take the forwards and the backward directions. And we get this, uh, we can get a simpler formula over here, which is very nice. But the question is really, um, what is the best probabilities that we should pick in order to optimize our bound? But before I get into that, I will briefly outline our proof technique, which is actually extremely simple, but very tedious to compute in practice. So what we do is that for the ideal quantum channel, we do a Taylor series expansion in the small parameter S. And for the quantum simulation that we are doing, we also do a Taylor series. These can be done and we can evaluate the low order terms explicitly because there's a finite number of them. We can write them all out and see how terms cancel out and then obtain an, a diamond norm on the, on the remainder term when they cancel. And as for the higher order terms, we use a tail bound uh, from, from, this, uh, from this paper over here. It's a very clever technique. And now the question that we faced with is how would we optimize the probabilities for our, um, for our algorithm? Recall that the simulation error that we had was looking quite complicated. It had a great number of terms and um, it's quite hard to read really. But what we do is that we take the leading order contribution of our simulation error and we attempt to minimize it, holding some terms to be constant. For example, we hold the number of expected gates per baby trotter step to be constant. Over here, mu bar is the expected number of, uh, of, uh, tr of terms that we pick in this so-called inactive set over here. So the active set is the set of uh, J's for which the probabilities um, saturate to one and an inactive set is the set of J's where the probability is strictly less than one. And of course this can be done without any loss of generality. And given that we can um, form an optimization problem that is uh, convex in P, has an objective function that's convex in P and linear constraints over here. And we find the optimum solution using optimality conditions. And surprisingly, the very simple um, optimal solution is given by the linear ansatz, where the P's are proportional to the Hamiltonian coefficients. And by brute force optimization over the things that, um, such as the expected number of gates per trotter step and the constant C, we can find that we have this new blue line over here, which is the performance of our sparse algorithm, which outperforms the previous bounds. And with that, I would like to end um, this talk with some um, discussions. Um, thank you. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Yang, uh, Yang Kai, sorry, for that very nice talk. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to go to some questions now. So. Uh, please, could you ask these on Slack in the session two talk one Uyang uh, uh, channel? 
And just to get things started, just while, while people are typing, maybe I'll start by, by asking a question. So you mentioned right at the end, the use of this for ethane, like you've had this uh, graph showing that your method performs better than the previous ones. I, I was wondering if there's anything sort of more general you can say about when you would expect your technique to be better than the previously known results. Like what kinds of Hamiltonians will it be particularly good for? Oh uh, yes, that's a very good question. Um, so I expect it to be um, particularly good for Hamiltonians for which the the Hamiltonian coefficients are not uh, are not evenly distributed. So it has some kind of a power law uh, decay, um, because if they were all even, then there's no there's no point really in in picking the Hamiltonian terms at random. Okay, so I guess you want you want them to decay, but not to decay very very quickly, because then I guess uh, it, it's it's easy to simulate maybe. Um, yes, so um, actually we have not fully explored the optimum um, probability distributions for which our um, simulation algorithm would have the maximum performance. But you can see that our simulation algorithm has as is is. Uh, special case, the previous uh, non non specified um, approach, so uh, it has to be better for some choices of probabilities, and we believe that it approaches the previous uh, complete specification approach. So, um, but the extent to which this gap can be maximized is still an open problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, so so now some questions have started coming in, so I'll ask some of these. So. Starting with a question from Yuan Su, uh, he asks that uh, to simulate a Hamiltonian, which is a sum of terms hj, you're assuming that the exponential of each hj can be realized by one elementary gate. Have you considered yes. the case where different exponentials have different costs, different hj? Uh, um, unfortunately, we have not uh, considered this uh, very interesting problem. We, we only considered um, the case in which each uh, gate was given uh, uh, an equal cost. And, and, that, and that's why our quantifier of cost was just the number of gates. Okay, thank you. And uh, moving on to a question from Adam Callison. He asks if the previous bounds are tight. So do, does the better bound that you found in your algorithm, does it mean actually the algorithm is definitely better or could it mean the previous algorithms were not tight? Uh, that's a very good question. I, um, so, I believe that the previous bounds are well. The previous bounds, I believe, can be can be tight. Um, I mean, there there will be some Hamiltonians for which these bounds can be can be tight. But the point of uh, of um, so the point of doing this sparsification approach is because uh, um, we want to impose some structure on our chemistry problem so that we, um, we can have uh, uh, better upper bounds with more assumptions on, on the structure of our problem. Um, so I guess the, the precise answer to that question is actually, I don't know. Uh, it depends on how you frame the question. If, uh, if you have not too many assumptions on the, on the type of Hamiltonian that you are simulating, then perhaps the previous bounds are, uh, are, are tight, are rather tight, but otherwise no. <laughs> but in practice, numerics shows that there's, uh, there's a substantial gap between these upper bounds and, uh, and what is possible. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure if anyone has any further questions to ask. We still have a couple of minutes scheduled. So if you do have any further questions, please, uh, type now or forever hold your peace. Uh, but if there are not any further questions, then I'd just like to thank uh, Yinkai again, and this was the speakers from the, the hardware panel, and say that we're going to be restarting after a nice long lunch break at 2.30. Um, and this is another great opportunity to have a discussion about posters, because I can see quite a few posters have now started uh, pouring into the, the poster session Slack channel. So it's a chance firstly to, to discuss the talks in this session and the rest of the morning, but also a chance to talk about the posters that are being put in there. Um, so I think uh, that's everything for this uh, session now. So thanks very much to all the speakers again, and I'll see you after lunch. Thank you.